Thank you. And now thirdly, Ed Richards, now managing partner of Flint Global and the independent chair of the Financial Services Trade Association's review, but after a, a, a long and distinguished period as uh, chief executive of Ofcom. And there is no doubt that in the various jobs I have done, Ed, while you were doing that job, I learned a lot from you. That's very kind, Anna. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon. Um, let, let me, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to uh, make any allegations of lies to high court judges or anything <laughs> of that kind. Uh, uh, the day will come, but today will not be the day for, for the full gory detail of my own experience. Um, uh, I actually want to cover broadly similar territory, so I'm going to sort of edit what I was going to say because some of it's been covered. But first, perhaps, just say the kind of uh, perspective that I take on this. So I used to work once upon a time in Downing Street. Uh, I then went to Ofcom, spent 11 years at Ofcom, around nine years as chief executive. And as Anna said, I've fairly recently set up a company, uh, and we do a lot of work with companies who work or uh, 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 interact with regulators and governments. So in a sense, I've seen this from three different perspectives. I've seen it inside politics. I've seen it as a chief executive of a, uh, a significant regulator uh, and from the perspective of companies as well. And what I want to do is actually put a little bit of history uh, on this because I think it's very important to see how this debate has changed through time. So when I think about this, I go back to the original conception, the intellectual conception of intellectual uh, of independent regulation, which was the precursor, if you like, to its first manifestation in the UK, which was really the Thatcher period in the 1980s. That's when the architecture of independent regulation uh, was established uh, and had a very, very good run. Uh, I then described the sort of New Labour or Blair period as one in which uh, a wider range of regulators were created. There were significant new powers awarded, not just to new regulators, but to uh, existing regulators as well. I think that was very significant, uh, particularly in terms of the breadth of scope. Uh, and then in the coalition period, uh, to uh, I don't want to repeat what Ed has said, but I would also add uh, there was obviously the thrust of the bonfire of the Quangos, which uh, I was a particular target of. Uh, there was some clipping of wings. Uh, some repatriation of powers, some interesting mergers and new creations, uh, and also a much stronger emphasis on budget controls, uh, freedom of information and things of, of that kind. Now, what are the key issues that emerge through time uh, over this? Well, firstly, uh, I think the easy one is that it is important to remember things like budgets, size, transparency and things of that kind and I think there was a period where some of that was slightly uh, lost touch with but the, by far the bigger issue as I think both Tom and Ed have said is the question uh, as you see it through time and indeed today as it relates to what I would call legitimacy and authority. Now uh, in the 1980s I think that legitimacy of independent regulation was almost a fact by virtue of a regulator being independent. There actually was, for a period, an almost quasi-constitutional bipartisan settlement, a sort of post-Thatcher settlement, that independent regulators were good, uh, they were doing the right things because they were independent. And that was the result of the history of a bad period in this country in which politicians, I think, by wide acceptance, meddled too much with state enterprises, state infrastructure and so on and so forth. And it did not produce good outcomes and I think people were very broadly persuaded that the model of independent regulation was a better way of making decisions in those key areas. Uh, so in a sense, we were in a situation where you were right purely because you were independent. You were legitimate purely because you were uh, independent. And I think that has changed quite significantly over the subsequent years. Uh, we've had perhaps the extreme example of that, which Tom has described in the rail track case. Uh, but one can think of a number of other examples. Uh, a recent one uh, where that relationship of understanding, I think, has changed. I mean, one is the case of NICE, where you have a very strong technical regulator uh, in that area, uh, and yet you have the government circumventing uh, essentially that regulatory approach, 
through the creation of something like the Cancer Drugs Fund, which is essentially a political decision to create a specific fund which circumvents the regulatory structure. Uh, that's fine, that's just one of those things and it's an, an observation. I think you can think about the financial services period in a similar way. So the tripartite regulatory model was deemed to have failed in the midst of the crisis. Uh, it was put under extraordinary pressure, obviously. Uh, but when one digs into that, and I've been in working in financial services for the last uh, many months, and you talk to people around the place on this, you say, well, what was it really like? And what you discover is that there was a very clear set of political guidance, which was described as light touch. But when you, when you scrape away at it, you discover that many people would describe it as heavy touch. So what was in fact happening was that there was a regulatory construct, which was supposedly independent in many respects, but the political relationship with that regulatory uh, infrastructure was clearly changing, and there were very different views about the extent to which light touch was in fact heavy touch in terms of guidance. And let me give you another example from telecoms, which is my own world, which is mobile roaming. Uh, you'll all have enjoyed uh, mobile roaming, uh, the reductions to mobile roaming as you travel abroad, but uh, th this case sort of sticks in my mind because I was a very uh, heavily involved in the body of European regulators when mobile roaming was being discussed. Uh, and I remember one particular meeting where I turned up and there was a fantastic piece of econometrics that had been done. Uh, and the view articulated in the private meeting was that we'd done the cost analysis, the analysis was right, and the politicians were wrong. Uh, and I stood up in that meeting and I said, you might think that the cost analysis is right, uh, and I don't have the model to hand to verify that, but I can tell you that this is not going to work. Uh, and there were two or three of us out of 27, 28, who took that view. Uh, it was ignored by the majority. The consequence was that it became a crusade uh, in Europe from the commissioner and the parliamentarians, and we all know what happened. Uh, the very careful econometrics that was correct was essentially thrown out, uh, and mobile roaming was changed very radically. Perhaps one final example uh, we, uh, of this trend, which I see uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, a blend of uh, how this relationship has changed, and that is, that is the energy sector that uh, Ed talked about. I think it's, it's very, very interesting how these things look from different perspectives and different positions in life. Uh, and um, I wasn't involved in energy, but I was looking in, in on it from outside. And you know, what an independent regulator and another regulator saw in the case of energy was Ed Miliband's price freeze proposal. Uh, the uh, result of that was uh, essentially a frenzy of activity, as Ed has described. Uh, from an independent regulatory perspective, what you would observe is that essentially standard operating procedures were frozen uh, completely. Uh, to some degree or another, policy was then being made either by Number 10 or by the Treasury or by the Department, but it certainly didn't seem as if it was being made by Ofgen in any normal sense. Now, clearly, actually, Ed's account of it is very interesting because they were, it was clearly more complex than it looked from the outside. But all these examples are illustrations of my central uh, observation on this and how things, I think, have changed through time which is that that relationship and that understanding of what we mean between the relationship of uh, the political, the politicians, government and independent regulators has changed through time and it has become rather messy, rather uncertain and slightly unpredictable and that is a serious question. Now I don't think that is necessarily wrong. Uh, I think the question is it, w what do we need to do to improve that? And I think the three, I'd make three observations about that. Um, the first is that I do think that in a number of cases, uh, some regulators have powers or a scope of their powers which may be too broad. I think there is a really serious question about whether the uh, success, the historic success of the independent regulatory model combined sometimes with politicians' desire to remove difficult questions from their own responsibility uh, has uh, 
created a risk that sometimes regulators are making decisions and judgments in areas that actually are more properly made by politicians. So that's the first issue, I think. The second one, which is an echo really of what both Tom and Ed have said, I think there has been some loss of memory and understanding amongst contemporary politicians, some loss of recognition as to why independent regulation is a good and important thing in the first place. And that may be the passage of time, the loss of understanding of what preceded it, but I would observe that myself, I had to almost re-explain why sometimes it is a very good idea to remove some of these decisions from government and let them be done by a technically able, uh, non-politically driven group of regulators. Uh, and I do worry about that, and I, I think that is a, a serious question. Equally, and thirdly, I think regulators, and this really is an echo of what Ed said, uh, I think there are and have been some regulators who have lost a sense of the source of their own legitimacy and authority. Uh, and I think occasionally they've become, or can become, slightly light-headed on the smell of their own technical prowess. Uh, sometimes these issues are very complicated, and sometimes these issues are not technically complicated. They're complicated because they involve value judgments, which do stray into the world of politics and judgment. And I think it's extremely important uh, for regulators to be very sensitive and aware of when that is and when that is not happening. And in my judgment, that has not always been the case. And to pick up those final, so on, on those three points, in my view, the problems arise, firstly, when regulators are doing jobs that they shouldn't really be doing, or when politicians have vacated ground that actually they should properly occupy. Secondly, when politicians have lost the plot about why it is good to exercise restraint and let independent regulators take independent decisions. And thirdly, when regulators themselves lose their intuition and their sense of uh, their own restraint about the place that an independent regulator has in a modern liberal democracy. So, I do worry about that, and I do worry that there is a simmering um, subterranean uh, risk in relation to the confidence that we have in this system. And I don't think that's just a confidence about the UK, it's a confidence of international investors into the UK. I think it matters enormously, because if you, again, take a historical, historical perspective about this, what you notice is that the system of independent regulation is absolutely central to the modern state and economy. Uh, it is how we can make rational, objective decisions which create a predictable and stable environment, which is precisely the environment which is most likely to, to facilitate both investment and competition. So making sure that this institutional architecture and its legitimacy and its functioning is of the top quality, to me, is absolutely central to a successful modern economy. So I do worry about it, and I think the time is right to reappraise whether we are in the right place in a number of sectors and whether we've got the right understanding and culture between both politicians and regulators. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed.